Hello everyone, my name is Onza, and welcome back to our journey through Norse mythology. The topic for today is the Mead of Poetry and Odin's Exile. Let's start with the former. As we stated in our video about the Aesir Vanir War, at the end of the conflict between the two pantheons, the gods met up and discussed the terms of peace, and at a at the conclusion of their meeting, they spat into a ritual bowl from which a being sharing all their knowledge and wisdom emerged. This being, a man named Kvasir, would venture throughout the cosmos giving counsel, good advice and a share of his knowledge to anyone who'd need it. One day, however, Kvasir was passing by the home of two dwarves named Fjallar and Galar. <sighs> and just to make one thing clear. Norse myths are filled with evil, devious and downright vile characters. Even the gods can act pretty horrid in a variety of situations. But I'm telling you, Fjallar and Galar are by far the biggest dicks in Norse mythology I have come across. And in this episode you will see why. So, Fjallar and Galar invited Kvasir into their home under the incentive that there was an important matter that required his wisdom and wit. Kvasir, having no reason to suspect the dwarves of any foul play, accepted their invitation and entered their home. As soon as Kvasir entered, however, Fjallar proceeded in bashing him over the head with a rock. Kvasir dropped to the ground unconscious and as soon as Galar closed the door, he helped the other dwarf with dragging Kvasir's body to the three large jugs they had readied beforehand. They then proceeded with slitting Kvasir's throat and draining all his blood into those three jugs. Once they were sure not a single drop was wasted, they brought honey and mixed it in with Kvasir's blood and brew it as mead. This concoction gave birth to a mead so special that anyone who were to drink but a single sip would become a wise man. When gods went to investigate the strange disappearance of Kvasir and were pointed at the home of Fjallar and Galar as the last place he had been seen at, the dwarves just smirked and told them that Kvasir choked on his own wisdom. Saddened, but without any proof against the dwarves, the gods ventured back to Asgard. But Odin, set on finding the truth of what happened, decided he should keep an eye on Fjallar and Galar and wait for them to make a mistake that would shine a light upon what happened to Kvasir. And so Odin sent his two ravens, Hugin and Munin, to follow the two dwarves wherever they might go and report to him of their actions and any and all developments that would reveal the nature of Kvasir's fate. And so Fjallar and Galar went about their daily business, oblivious of the two ravens who stayed near them at all times, ever watchful. One day, Fjallar and Galar felt in a malicious mood again, and they invited a giant called Gilling and his wife over to their home. They persuaded Gilling to row with them out to the sea on a fishing trip, and when the dwarves were sure they were far enough from the shore, they rocked the boat from side to side until Gilling fell overboard. Fjallar and Gar then took great hurry in rowing back to the shore, leaving the giant to drown. Fjallar and Galar laughed at the giant's fate, but they weren't done, no no no, not by far. As they imagined, they could take advantage of the Gilling's surely distressed wife, now widow, and lay with her, purely as a consolation of course. When they informed Gilling's wife of her husband's unfortunate demise, uh, the giant had started to cry and wail at the loss of her poor husband, but her cries grew so loud and annoying that the two dwarves soon lost any interest in laying with her and instead consulted with each other of how to get rid of her. <laughs> Now you've already seen Fjallar and Galar in action, so I want you to get yeah, I, I want you to just guess in what way did they plan to get rid of the giantess? Uh, maybe they would, I don't know, strangle her? Hmm? Hmm? No? Well, how about poisoning her drink or food or something? Hmm? No? 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 No! This is fucking Fjallar and Galar we are talking about. You know this is going to be anything but simple. No, no, no. Fjallar and Galar figured the perfect way of how to get rid of Gilling's wife and get a good laugh out of it. Galar went outside to get to his part of the plan, while Fjallar came to the grieving widow and asked her if the sight of the sea where her husband met his unfortunate fate wouldn't help bringing her closure. The crying giantess nodded and followed Fjallar to the door, but as soon as she stepped out, 
Galar, who was ready on the roof just over the doorway, dropped a massive boulder that landed right on the giantess and squashed her to red paste. <sighs> yeah, yeah, that, that's that's Fialar and Galar, everybody. The biggest assholes in Norse mythology. <sighs> well, after that ordeal, Fialar and Galar laughed so hard that they didn't even notice another giant arrived to their house. It was Sutung the son of Gilling and his wife, who was supposed to arrive with his parents but got delayed. When Sutung saw his mother squashed like a strawberry pancake, he beat up both the laughing dwarves and tied them up, and rowing out to the sea, he threw them on a small island that would flood with rising tide. The dwarves were apologizing profusely the whole way there and begged Sutung for forgiveness, but the giant would have none of it. Only when he was about to row back to the shore, leaving the two to drown, the dwarves offered Sutung their special meat in exchange for their lives. Sutung stopped for a moment and let the dwarves explain what the nature of that special meat was. When they did, Sutung's desire for revenge was replaced by greed, and he freed the two dwarves, who, after arriving back to their home, took out the meat from their secret stash and handed it over to him. Sutung then ventured back home, and being cautious of his new valuable possession, he hid the three jugs of meat under a mountain called Hnitbjörg, and employed his daughter Gunlot to guard it, and then barricaded the only entrance by a massive stone that only he could move. Now this whole entire ordeal has been watched closely by Hugin and Munin, and with the information they gathered, they flew back to Odin, and settling upon his shoulders, they whispered to him what they've learned both about the fate of Kvasir and about the unique liquor made out of his blood and its unusual properties. Odin's eyes gleamed at the news. After the horrid events of the Aesir one year war, Odin realized that being rash and hot-headed were not attributes that would do a man any good, and thanks to both the art of Seder he learned from Freya and from the constant talks and conversations he shared with Mimir, Odin understood the value of wisdom and knowledge, and upon hearing of the wondrous properties of the meat of poetry, he, just as Sutung, forgot all about the justice that the dead deserved, and his desire shifted to acquiring the magical brew. However, Odin knew that Sutung was too protective of the meat to be tricked or persuaded to give it up, and so the god decided to go about obtaining the brew a different way. Odin learned that the giant Sutung had a brother named Baugi, and he intended to use him to get to the meat. Baugi owned great fields of wheat in Jotunheim, and those fields needed a good number of men to walk them. Baugi had nine thralls, a position that could be compared to that of a slave, and he walked them hard to make sure they would get his fields harvested in time. This meant that the lads were walked from dusk till dawn, and their scythes would get dull quite frequently. Odin saw this and disguised himself as a simple laborer, traveling from farmstead to farmstead, looking for work. When he approached the thralls, who were doing their best walking with dull scythes, he offered them he could sharpen their tools. The thralls happily agreed, and Odin took out a whetstone from his cloak and sharpened the scythes one by one. When he was done, the thralls were astonished at how much it eased their work, as the scythes seemingly glided through the wheat, with little to no effort on their part. The thralls then beseeched Odin and begged him to sell them the wondrous whetstone, as with it, they would have all their work finished in no time. Odin agreed to sell them the whetstone, but he warned them. The price is high for what I offer. Luckily for you, each of you is able to pay it, he said with a knowing smirk. It now depends only on which of you will be the first to take up my offer. He then threw the whetstone high into the air, and as it began to fall back down, each of the lads threw themselves in its way in an attempt to catch it. Unfortunately, in the heat of the moment, they all forgot they were still brandishing their newly sharpened scythes, and in the brawl and commotion that followed, they all mutually cut each other's throats. And so Odin smirked once more, and shaking his head, he picked up the whetstone from among the pile of dead bodies, each of the lads paying the price for it with their lives. He then sought refuge for the night at Bogi's homestead, introducing himself as a traveling laborer by the name of Bolverk. Baugi granted him a bed and a meal for the night, and complained to him that he found out 
that all his thralls strangely killed each other this afternoon while walking his fields and that he now, in the middle of the harvest season, had no one to pick up the work they left behind. Odin did his best to hide his smirk as this was all part of his plan. He offered Baugi that he alone would pick up all the work of his deceased thralls and finish it in time in exchange for a drink of the precious meat of Baugi's brother Sutung. Baugi would have none of it, however, as Sutung was very protective of his meat and would let no one have even a sip. Odin insisted though and finally persuaded the giant to at least try and bargain with his brother to give Bolvik a drink of his meat when and if he would finish all the work he promised. With the terms settled, Odin got to work the very next day and throughout the whole harvesting season he filled the role of nine men and by the end of autumn he had all the work he promised done and asked Baugi for his payment. However, Baugi was a craven and a scummy individual, and although he agreed to Bolverk's terms, he knew Sutton wouldn't grant anyone even a drop of his meat, nor would he be happy that Baugi was promising others a drink of what wasn't his property. Hoping to evade conflict with both Bolverk and his brother, Baugi tried to offer Bolverk many other ways of repaying him, but Odin would have none of it, and he pushed Baugi to honor his word and go with him to Sutung to try to get him to give Bolverk a drink. Baugi reluctantly agreed to uphold his promise, and the two arrived to Sutung's home some time later. Baugi explained to Sutung his agreement with Bolverk and tried to appeal to his brother, asking him if he would spare a sip of his meat for Bolverk's work. Just as Baugi expected though, Sutun rejected his pleas harshly and sent them both away without as much as a word in. Baugi then told Bolverk that, due to these unfortunate circumstances, he would need to choose some other method of repayment. Odin, however, wouldn't hear of it and he practically ordered Baugi to stop being such a whim and to uphold his part of the bargain. Baugi got somewhat offended, though deep inside he knew he was as spineless as they get and so to shut Bolvak up, he told him he'd take him to the mountain where Sutung hid his meat just to show him that there was no way they could get inside to the jugs of liquor. Odin perked up at the offer and gladly took it, his mind slowly coming up with a plan. Once they arrived to the mountain, Baugi let Bolvak bask in its enormity for a few moments before trying to convince him once again that there was no way inside and that he better stop wasting his time and ask for a different sort of payment for his work. Odin, although getting tired of Baugi's constant spineless remarks, had to admit he saw no way into the mountain. He was not willing to give up, however, and he reached into his cloak and took out an auger. He then told Baugi to drill a hole into the rock so Odin could peer in and see if he could find any way in from the inside. Baugi took the auger quite eagerly, thinking the simple tool would soon dull and break upon the mountainside, so he was surprised when the auger did not only stay in one piece, but actually managed to bite into the hard rock of the mountain and start to drill through. Just as the whetstone Odin used to get rid of Baugi's thralls, this auger was enchanted and in no time the giant was sweating profusely, both from the hard work, the kind of which he never did in his life, and also out of fear that Bolwerk might actually find some way inside after he would have a look in, which would only mean bad news for Baugi once his brother would find out. And so Baugi drilled halfway through the rock and told Bolwerk that he was finished, hoping that if he looked inside and saw only darkness of the rock, he would think there was no possible way of finding a way inside the mountain. Odin, however, wasn't a simpleton, and he blew into the hole Baugi drilled, and when small pieces of rock and waste made by his drilling flew out in his face, he gave Baugi a stern look and ordered him to keep drilling. Baugi, slightly intimidated by the sudden change in Bolvik's demeanor, kept drilling until he felt the auger slipped on the other side of the rock. When he told Bolvog he was done, Odin blew into the hole and as soon as the dust and waste from the drilling flew out on the other side, he changed into a small serpent and slid inside. Baugi then realized that Bolvog 
who he had up until that point thought of as just a simple lad, was in reality some powerful sorcerer, and he quickly tried to thrust the ogre after him, but to no avail. Odin was already on the other side. Bogi thought about running back to Sutung, but he was too cowardly to admit to his brother. He revealed the location of the mead to someone and thus put his property in jeopardy. And so Baugi decided to run home rather than to his brother and pretend like none of this ever happened. Ignorance is bliss, after all. Meanwhile, Odin had changed back into his normal form and navigated the darkened depths of the mountain until he came upon a lit chamber with a young and beautiful giantess. It was Gunnlod, Sutung's daughter, whom the giant had tasked with guarding the mead. Gunnlod was ready for a fight as soon as she saw Odin approach but the god was keen and quick-witted, and he soon knew how to subdue the giantess. Giantess or not, she was still a young woman, locked away all alone by her father, with no one to even share a word with. And so Odin used flattery and compliments to make Gunnlod feel more at ease with him, before he himself dropped down his clothes and stood naked in front of the wide-eyed giantess. But just as he expected, her shock soon turned into desire, and the many days of build-up solitude, neglect and lust came crashing down and the young giantess quickly shed her own garments and they were both locked in lover's embrace soon after. Yeah, a good life lesson. Why fight when you can bang? I am surprised that this was not one of Odin's sayings. Anyway, the two spent three days sharing a bet, engaging in all manner of sexual depravities, and in exchange for the fun she had, Gunnlod agreed to let Bolverg have three sips of her father's meat. Odin, however, wasn't quite going to satisfy himself with what three sips, and before Gunnlod could stop him, he emptied all three jugs of meat in three big gulps, and changing into an eagle, he quickly found a small crevice in the mountainside and headed back to Asgard. However, Sutung heard his daughter's shrill cries of both anger and betrayal, and he quickly ran to the mountain to see what had happened. Once he found out, he quickly changed into an eagle himself and began his pursuit of Bolverg. Odin soon realized that his stomach full of meat made him too slow to escape Sutung who was quickly gaining on him, and in an attempt to delay his enemy, Odin spat a mouthful of the magical liquid behind him, and as he suspected, Sutung dove down, trying desperately to catch every drop of the precious liquor. However, he might as well have been trying to catch raindrops, as he wasn't able to save anything but meager few droplets. It just so happened though, that during this time the two adversaries were flying over Midgard, and all the drops of mead of poetry that fell down to the realm of men are the reason of all the poets of our world. At the same time, Vili and Vey, Odin's brothers, stood under the ruins of Asgard's wooden walls, a bitter reminder of the war between the gods. The two brothers were on a lookout for Odin, as their brother left quite some time ago, and no word of his whereabouts have they heard since his departure. This, however, wasn't something Vili and Vey lost any sleep over. They were warriors by blood, and so they weren't at all fond of Odin's decision to make peace with the Vanir, let alone to share their home with some of them. They also noticed how Odin rose to be an unspoken leader of the gods of Asgard, a fact which made them quite envious. They also couldn't help but feel jealous that the beautiful Freya, who, before the events of the Aesir Vanir war, shared her bed with whomever she wished, now preferred to spend her time with Odin alone. All these things added up to Vili and Vey almost resenting their brother, envious of his influence and position, and they spent the time while Odin was gone scheming and devising a plan of how to take his place in case he did not return. Just as they talk about their future actions, however, a quite chubby eagle, barely being able to stay in the air, caught their eye. The two brothers laughed at the grotesque looking bird before they realized it was flying right at them. When the bird almost crashed to their feet, it suddenly changed and their brother, whom they thought lost, now stood before them. Now before I go on, I have to make something clear. I already mentioned how the practicing of Seder, the Norse form of magic, was, even though respected, feared and those who practiced it were seen as untrustworthy. 
but more importantly, it was also seen as an inherently womanly practice and something utterly unmanly for a man to undertake. That might not seem like a big deal to us today, but during the Viking Age, men who were found as unmanly were not just ridiculed, but shamed and despised, sometimes even to the point of being exiled from their home or even killed for the shame they brought upon themselves and their kin. And this was very much true for Odin as well, and he was seen as a patron for all male practitioners of Seder during the Viking Age. With all that in mind, you can understand that Vili and they were quite resentful of Odin. This was supposed to be their leader, a man doubling in womanly witchcraft. Whatever they thought, they said nothing, as he was still their brother and they cared for him. But nevertheless, knowing this information might prove useful to them in a later time. After some silent gesticulations from Odin, his brothers brought him an empty barrel and he spewed all the meat from his stomach inside. After that, he was able to tell them where he has been all this time and what was so special about the mead. His brothers listened closely, exchanging worrying glances from time to time, as the image of their brother as a warrior slowly changed to that of a scheming sorcerer. Nevertheless, they helped him hit the mead inside Asgard's halls and spoke no more of this sad affair, although Vili and Vey talked together in great length that night. Uh, let me continue via quote. Quote. The next day, the frost giants came into Odin's hall to ask of Bolverk whether he was among the gods or whether by Sutung he was slain. I believe that Odin swore upon his ring to them, but who can trust Odin? He left Sutung deceived in his own home and he left Gunlof weeping. End quote. What we can derive from this quote is that when the frost giants came to Asgard to ask about Bolverk, who was last seen flying in that direction, Odin swore an oath to them upon his arm ring that there was no one by that name among the gods. In a way, he told the truth as for Odin, Bolverk was not but a mask to be worn, but no one can deny that there was a deception in that statement. And while Odin may have won one battle, there was still one awaiting him from among his own. Villain Vey stood idly by when Odin dealt with the giants, but as soon as they left, they could stay silent no longer. They were already questioning their brother's integrity when they found out about his doubling in Seder, a skill so shameful for a man to practice, but now he had made a false oath upon his armoring. An armoring was seen as a symbol of a man's position within the society, and to swore an oath upon it meant you were willing to put your reputation and honor as proof for the sincerity and truthfulness of your word and actions. To swear falsely upon an arm ring was a gesture of the greatest dishonor. Vili and Vey saw this not just a great dishonor to their family and the other gods, but also as an opportunity to replace Odin as rulers of Asgard. They revealed Odin's practice of Seder before everyone, as well as the deception and theft of Sutung's meat, crowned by the dishonest oath on his sacred arm ring. The other gods were shocked, to say the least, but it was Vili and Vey who drove them to push Odin to exile for his actions, as his deceit and oath-breaking stained their own good name. Shortly after, Odin was driven out of Asgard with nothing more than a spear, cloak and a sack of only the most important things. However, the exiled god didn't care much for his banishment. He saw this as an opportunity to set out and see and experience the cosmos, not held back by the duties of ruling. And solitude was not a trouble he would experience on his journey, as one of the most important things he took with him was the head of his friend Mimir, now comfortably sleeping in the sack over his shoulder. And so Odin set out into the cosmos in search for ever more wisdom and we will see many of his adventures in the future. But this would be all for today, and I bid you all farewell. Until next time.